Hello and welcome. My name is Victor Gijsbers and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In this video, I want to take a look at a paper written by Susanna Siegel and the paper is called Cognitive Penetrability and Perceptual Justification. So Susanna Siegel's Cognitive Penetrability and Perceptual Justification. I want to start this video by explaining the meaning of three core terms of this paper, two of which are there in the title. So I want to explain to you, well, what is perceptual justification? What is cognitive penetrability? And we will also want to take a look at the term epistemic elevation. So let's start with those three terms and then later on we return to the overall argument that Siegel is presenting here. So perceptual justification is just the idea that we can be justified or more justified in believing something because of our perception. Right? So perceptual justification is a process where by perceiving something, we become justified in believing a particular proposition or we become more justified in believing a particular proposition. So, for instance, to take a very simple example, you may wonder and have no idea about whether I own a bust of Friedrich Nietzsche. And now if you look at your screen, you are going to have a visual perception that really justifies you in believing that I have a bust of Friedrich Nietzsche because basically you just saw me hold up that bust and show it to you. So that would be an example of perceptual justification. And to use the third term that I mentioned, epistemic elevation, uh, well, that's really what happened here. Elevation is getting something to a higher level. So maybe you already had some uh, degree of belief, some degree of justification for believing that I owned a Nietzsche bust, but having seen me show it to you on camera, you get a boost, an epistemic boost. There's an elevation of your justification. Uh, and so Siegel uses this term epistemic elevation throughout the paper to uh, consider this phenomenon where we get a boost in how much justification we have. Okay, the first term in the title and the one that in a sense is the most central to the paper or the most particular to the paper, you could say, is this idea of cognitive penetrability. So what's that? cognitive penetrability. Well, apparently it means that something cognitive, something having to do with, uh, you know, the states of our mind maybe, penetrates something else. Well, the thing that is penetrated here is our experience. So for instance, to just use one uh, sense modality as an example, our visual experience. The phenomenon of cognitive penetrability would be the phenomenon that the contents of my visual experience depend on, in one way or another, my state of mind. So to take a few examples of states of mind that, that might, be, might be meant here, uh, it could be the case that the mood I am in somehow oh, like changes what I see. It could be the case that my beliefs change what I see. It could be the case that my hopes or desires change what I see, that my expectations change what I see, right? So it could be the case that, oh, I don't know, I really, really want the person I'm, uh, I'm talking to to believe that my plan is a good idea, right? I'm trying to sell this plan to them. I really hope that they will sort of, you know, be encouraging and say yes. And I look at their face, well, if I see them look encouraging because I want them to look encouraging, right? If that's what's going on, if they actually, you know, maybe in other circumstances, I would have correctly seen that they had a neutral face, but now I really want them to look encouraging. And yeah, you know, I check it out and I think, oh, he's looking encouraging. Uh, that would be a case of cognitive penetration. So cognitive penetrability, is the idea that visual perception, or maybe other perception, but let's stick with visual perception, that this can happen to visual perception, right? That things can look different because of the mood I am in, or maybe the desires I have, or the beliefs that I have, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what is Siegel interested in? 
Zico was interested in more or less assuming that there's such a thing as cognitive penetrability. And then she's going to wonder whether existing theories of perceptual justification can deal with that. And in particular, here's the problem that she's going to point out for, well, mostly one theory, which she calls dogmatism, but she generalizes it, it at the end of the paper. Um, here's the problem that she, see, she sees for those theories. Those theories might claim that even in situations where cognitive penetration takes place and takes place in such a way that you know we would really intuitively want to say that there's no justification going on that still in those situations justification is going on okay so let me repeat that what Zico is worried about is that standard theories of perceptual justification are going to be wrong in situations of cognitive penetration why are they wrong well they're going to be wrong because they're going to incorrectly claim that this perception which has been cognitively penetrated gives me perceptual justification right that it leads to epistemic elevation as she calls it whereas in fact it doesn't lead to epistemic elevation so to take an example that um, that Zigo herself uses suppose that Jill believes that Jack is angry right she believes that Jack is angry she sees Jack and oh he has an angry face well you know that's what she sees right she, she sees Jack as looking angry but she only sees that because she already believes that he's angry right if she hadn't believed that that's our assumption if she hadn't believed that she wouldn't have seen his face as angry she would have seen him as neutral okay here's the question we would like to ask ourselves is Jill after seeing Jack being angry in this way more justified right is she epistemically elevated to a higher level for her belief that Jack is angry and Ziegel says well you know we would like to say no right we would like to say no because she's only seeing him, him as angry because she already believes that he's angry and if she hadn't had that belief then she wouldn't have had that perception and that seems a very weak type of perception to use as justification right there's something circular about it it's like because you already believe something you get this visual evidence that your belief is right but if you hadn't believed it then you would have different evidence and so it seems to be circular it seems to be like um it seems to be like you shouldn't like that that it's not the case that you get extra evidence just because you expect to get evidence right or because you're in a mood to get evidence or something like that so in these situations of epistemic elevate or sorry in these situations of cognitive penetration Siegel says at least in in this type of situation there shouldn't be epistemic elevation but again her worry is that most theories of perceptual justification are going to say that there is in fact epistemic elevation okay so let's delve into a few aspects of that in a little more detail just a little more detail Siegel's uh, Siegel's paper is very detailed uh, and I'm going to skip over most of that detail just to get the sort of broad outline across okay so here's one thing we should acknowledge the first thing we should acknowledge is that cognitive penetration doesn't have to be bad here's an example uh, suppose I'm a doctor and I have trained to look at x-rays and to recognize cancer in x-rays okay so I look at an x-ray and the patient also looks at the same x-ray right now what I see you know the patient sees some black and white lines doesn't really make any sense I see a tumor okay I see a tumor in the picture Okay, that would be a, a, a pretty obvious example of cognitive penetration, right? What I see depends on my beliefs, my training, and so on and so forth. It's not bad, right? It doesn't put me in a bad position. And we, sh we, we would like to say, of course, that looking at this X-ray photograph, I now have a better reason to believe that this patient has a tumor. Right, that's that's good that that well it's not good that they have a tumor but like the epistemic conclusion here is is the right one okay so 
It's not the case that necessarily all types of cognitive penetration are bad. So what Ziegel is going to do in the article is she's going to focus on a very specific type of cognitive penetration. It's the type where there's this circularity, right? It's the type where you believe something or, and because you believe it, you see things in such a way that they seem to indicate that your belief is true. And if you hadn't believed it, then you would have seen something else, right? You would not have seen things in such a way that they uh, would justify that belief. So the example that we already gave is Jill looking at Jack, right? Jill believes that Jack is angry. That's why he looks angry to her. If she hadn't believed that, she wouldn't have believed. She wouldn't have seen that. Um, another example that, uh, that Ziegel uses is um, a scientist who expects to see a certain kind of phenomenon in the microscope looks in the microscope and sees it because they expect it, right? And if they hadn't expected it, they wouldn't have seen it. Okay, so those are the kinds of like circular examples that could, could create a problem for a theory of, uh, of uh, perceptual justification. And so those are the ones that, um, that Siegel is interested in. All right, so how do those kinds of cases create trouble for, you know, standard theories of perceptual justification? Well, the theory that Siegel spends most time talking about is dogmatism. Now, dogmatism sounds like a strange name for a philosophical theory, right? I mean, who wants to be dogmatic? But in fact, dogmatism here is, um, well, it's so named because it's a specific kind of response to skepticism. It's basically the kind of response to skepticism that says that you should just believe your eyes unless you have a reason not to. Right? You should believe your senses unless you have a reason not to. That sort of in broad outline the idea of uh, the idea of dogmatism. So the crucial thing here for the discussion of um, of cognitive penetration, cognitive penetrability, is that the dogmatist believes this. The dogmatist believes that if there are no defeaters, then having a perceptual experience with content P suffices to give you justification for believing P. Okay, let's say that again if there are no defeaters. In particular, that means if I, if I know nothing else that shows that P is false, right? Or that, that at least gives me good reasons to believe that P is false. So suppose there's nothing sort of negative epistemically surrounding P, this proposition that I'm interested in. Well, if that's the case, then if I have an experience with content P, then that is by itself uh, enough to justify me in believing that P. All right, so if you have no reasons to believe that I don't own a Nietzsche bust, right? Um, and there's also not going to be anything in your perception that that indicates that I don't own a Nietzsche bust. Like I, you know, you see uh, maybe all kinds of uh, image manipulation suddenly going on or something like that. So if you have no defeaters, then, you know, simply you seeing me holding a Nietzsche bust is good enough for you to believe that I hold a Nietzsche bust, right? That's the idea. Okay, so why would dogmatism, right? Which is basically the idea just that unless there's, unless you have counter evidence, you should believe what your perception is telling you. Um, why is that in trouble when it comes to cognitive penetration? Well, because these circular examples that Siegel has given us, there's no, def there don't seem to be any defeaters but we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and so dogmatism would tell me that I, I, I'm justified in believing what I see, right? Jill is justified in believing that Jack is angry because she sees that he's angry. But she's not justified in believing that he's angry, right? Or at least no epistemic elevation is taking place, right? This experience should not give her a boost. So dogmatism, because it says that you can, you know, simply believe what you see, gets into trouble here, maybe with cognitive penetration. Okay, maybe, what's the maybe? Well, Siegel spends um, a serious amount of time in, um, in section four to think about the two ways that the dogmatist could respond to this. Okay, there's one way where the dogmatist says, well, actually, okay, my theory tells you that you should believe 
or are more justified, get this epistemic elevation um, for Jack being angry, for instance. But that's the right answer, right? There actually is epistemic elevation. So that's one way to respond. The other way to respond is, of course, to say that your theory doesn't imply that Jill gets epistemic elevation. Um, but the only way in which she might fail to get that is if there are defeaters, right? Because that, that was just the content of dogmatism. Unless there are defeaters, you get this boost. So if you want to claim that there's no boost, you have to argue that there are defeaters. So two things that dogmatism can try, right? Dogmatism can try to claim, no, it's actually right that Jill gets an epistemic boost. Or the dogmatist can claim, no, Jill actually has defeaters, and so she doesn't get an epistemic boost. So how to, how to do that? Well, one way to try to argue that an epistemic boost is okay is to say that, um, you know, Jill is doing, doing sort of everything right. I mean, trusting your experience is a good idea. Trusting your perceptions is a good idea. If you're trusting your perceptions, you're doing the right thing. It does give you extra justification. Even if, you know, an outside observer knows that, um, that it's not good evidence, right? So it's not really good evidence for Jill that she sees Jack being angry, but still for her, right? It could be, it could give increased justification. Right? That's, that's something you could try to say. What Siegel points out is that, well, we can surely think of cases and, and we can think of a particular version of this Jill and Jack case where we don't want to say that Jill is, you know, doing things right, even from her own perspective, for instance. Right? Maybe Jill knows that she is, you know, really, um, really uh, uh, prone to sort of interpreting other people's behavior based on her own preconceptions or things like that. Right? So it's certainly not clear that even if the dogmatist can think of some cases where, okay, maybe you are justified, um, it's certainly not clear that this would hold true in all cases. And of course, that's enough for, for, for Siegel, right? She just has to show that there are some cases of cognitive penetrability that the dogmatist might have, have difficulty dealing with. So what about the other thing, right? Trying to show that there actually are defeaters. Well, here you could try this, right? You could try to say something like, well, maybe Jill knows that she's only seeing Jack angry because that's what she already believes. Right? And maybe that's a defeater. Maybe that's a reason to not take this experience seriously. Uh, and here too, you know, I guess it, it could be true, but you can also think of, of cases um, where it's not the case that Jill knows this, right? Where Jill, um, it's not the case that Jill sort of has access to or, you know, knows any facts that should point out to her that her experience is, uh, is not very good that her experience is not justifying. These are sections where Siegel goes into a lot more detail than I'm going to do now. I just want to set out these two strategies and suggest to you that it's probably possible, like for any strategy maybe that the dogmatist can try to come up with here, at least like basic versions of those strategies, to, um, to come up with an example of cognitive penetrability where, or of cognitive penetration where you know, the, the strategy of the dogmatist is not going to work. Okay, so, so far for the dogmatist, and again, I mean, this is quickly going over a lot of, uh, a lot of important detail. What I said at the beginning is that this is supposed to apply to theories of, of perceptual justification more generally. And let's just give one example of that, which is an example that Siegel also gives, which is the example of the coherentist, right? So the coherentist doesn't believe that if you have a perception with a content P, then you're automatically allowed to believe P. The coherentist believes that that depends on all the other things that you believe, right? It depends, among other things, um, on whether your this belief that P fits your other beliefs, whether um, the idea that you know you are now in good circumstances to make a good observation fits into your other beliefs and uh, and so on and so forth and so Siegel points out 
that the coherentist you know, gets into the exact same situation really as the dogmatist, right? Suppose that Jill has, you know, some pretty okay evidence that Jack is angry, but like not really enough to be justified, but some pretty good evidence. Um, okay, and you know, her beliefs are sort of almost at the point where they justify believing that Jack is angry, but like not quite. And now we have this, this observation of the angry Jack, which we only have because we already have all those, those beliefs, right? Um, okay, you know, that could be enough to give us this epistemic boost and now we're justified in believing it. But it doesn't, right? I mean, it's still circular. It's still something that we, that we don't want, right? We're still having a, a perception that we wouldn't have had if we had started out with different beliefs. And so it can't really justify the beliefs that we have. That's the idea. So the idea is that there could be, you know, other and maybe even lots of theories of perceptual justification that face the same problem. And so Siegel's point at the end of the article is basically, you know, to post this as a challenge, right? If you think about perceptual justification, uh, one of the things that you have to do is make sure that your theory can deal with these kinds of circularities. Or maybe give an argument that cognitive penetration is impossible, but that seems to be seems to be perhaps a little hard. All right, that's what I wanted to say about cognitive penetrability and perceptual justification by Susanna Siegel. And um, as I said, there's much more detail in the paper, so you can check that out if you uh, want to know more about it.